Hello. My name is Anne McElhenney. Welcome to the Anne and Film Scoop with just Anne McElhenney today. You'll notice that I'm on my own. Um, film got COVID. So what happened was I came back from New York and I got COVID first. I sat in a plane with the guy. The guy sitting beside me was wearing a mask. And at one stage during the flight, he takes the mask down and does the most dramatic, most violent sneeze I've possibly ever experienced. And I was wearing a dress and I was bare legged and he literally drenched me so badly that I had to go to the bathroom to tidy up. I came back and I was debating whether or not to say anything to him. And then I thought, you know, I actually I'm going to say something to this guy. So I said, you did actually, you know, destroy. Oh, he said, my allergies are very bad. So one of the big lessons today that I want to share with you, um, you know, this is, you know, you come here for this kind of incredibly important advice. Anyone who tells you at the moment that they have really bad allergies I would check in with that because the chances are they don't have bad allergies at all. They probably have COVID. So anyway, I came, I came back and I doubt, like literally immediately started to feel unwell. And, you know, I actually said for about three days that I thought I had allergies, really bad allergies. Then I kind of realized I don't really suffer badly from allergies. So anyway, watch out for that allergy uh, narrative. It's, it's nonsense. But anyway, Phelan and I tried to keep a distance from each other. But anyway, I think I think this variant apparently is very very contagious. But anyway, I am on my own flying solo. Um, but I have a few important stories, I think, that that I think you'll be you'll be glad we're we're here together for this. Um, in this week's podcast, we have now learned what Hunter Biden's sugar brother, uh, Kevin Morris, the lawyer Kevin Morris was up to and what his plan is to help um, Hunter Biden. So we're going to hear more about that in a minute. And as we wait for the Supreme Court decision, you'll notice a lot of leftists, a lot of pro-abortion activists are lying about what's going to happen in the Supreme Court. We're going to look at that, but also I'm going to look at a few moments in the past, in the past decades, by the way, where liberals have accidentally told the truth about abortion when they didn't, ex- when they didn't think they were telling the truth. And I think there are just a couple of examples that I kind of discovered and I, I'd be interested in sharing with you and I'd also be interested in any examples you have that you'd like to share with us because I think this is a very important time to be thinking about the issue. Um, and State Farm, the insurance company, have become creepy State Farm, like a good creepy neighbour. Um, we'll bring you that story, extraordinary story from Florida and from the nationally from State Farm Company. And one of the U.S.'s most influential guru teachers has now confessed that she got basically everything wrong. But the great thing about being a leftist is you never have to say you're sorry. But first, I want to start with this story that was covered in the New York Times, but also in C- on CBS, who seem to be working very closely with Kevin Morris, um, or at least he's, he's getting to his story out very quickly into the CBS. So Kevin Morris is the lawyer that you know, as you, as you know, came on the set of the Mice on Hunter movie and spied, basically spied on us and lied to us about his intentions, didn't tell us he was a lawyer representing Hunter Biden, um, didn't tell us any of that. So it turns out, and this is from CBS News, the Hollywood lawyer working with Hunter Biden has recruited a team of more than 30 that's three zero, by the way, 30 lawyers and investigators to probe the backstory of how the laptop containing years of personal and intimate emails and business records of Hunter Biden found its way uh, to the new, to news reporters and the authorities. Um, so basically, this is this is now the story. This is now actually what's happening. And Kevin Morris is speaking to journalists. He's speaking to CBS News. And apparently he's walking around town here in, in L.A. with a slideshow telling people what what his what his intentions are with his documentary. I mean, as you know, he came on the set, he came out to to Serbia, represented himself as a as a journalist, I suppose, as a documentary filmmaker. Um did not say, did not tell us that he was actually a lawyer working for Hunter Biden, that Hunter Biden is a client of his. A client, by the way, that he gave $2 million to the IRS to pay off his tax um, his tax delinquencies. Um, extraordinary. I mean, an extraordinary thing. But basically, the CBS story goes on to describe this, this. So this is the intention now of Kevin Morris. Kevin Morris is really obsessed with working out the providence of the, of the laptop. Where did the laptop come from? How did the laptop get into the hands of whatever? And it kind of misses the point. I think, you know, here's my message to Kevin Morris. You're kind of missing the point, Kevin Morris. It's not so much really where the laptop come from. What's really important is what's on the laptop, which is not being disputed by anybody on the Biden side. No one on the Biden side is saying that there's anything, you know, that it's that there's anything wrong with with um 
that, that, that the laptop is actually the Hunter Biden laptop. But this is what he's doing anyway. He's obviously, there's a, this is a, you know, and I, one of the thoughts that I had when I read this story was, isn't it lovely to have really, really wealthy friends? Isn't it really lovely to be filthy rich, to be so filthy rich that you have a team of 30 lawyers and investigators working to try and cover up this story again and the and the cover up is extraordinary because what they're covering up is the fact that Hunter Biden was a bagman for Joe Biden that he was collecting money all over the basically all over the world from China from Russia from the Ukraine from all over the place from all kinds of dodgy dealers and giving 10% to the big guy and he has still to explain who the big guy was but i think we all really know who that is so this is what Kevin Morris is up to and one of the things he's found you know one of the big big reveals is Morris's effort on Hunter Biden's behalf involves searching for alternative accounts of the chain of custody of the laptop and various copies of its hard drive. Um, a source on Morris's team has told CBS News the slides describe, so these are the slides that he's going around Los Angeles with, the slides describe this as a contextualized theory. So they want to contextualize this story of what transpired a year earlier in 2019 when Hunter Biden left his computer at the office of Keith Ablo, a Massachusetts therapist Hunter Biden visited for help with drug addiction. The slides don't make a direct accusation against Ablo, but appear to question whether Ablo could have shared the computer with Trump associates. Ablo, who is a former Fox News contributor, um, and has been no this is what CBS is saying, who has been noted for publicly blending his psychiatric assessments with high leaning, with right leaning political ideas, declined to comment for this report. One source familiar with the events told CBS News that Boris that Morris's theory does not match Ablo's previous descriptions of his actions. So, you know, and Ablo basically says he acknowledged that Hunter Biden did leave a laptop at his bungalow back in 2019, but he but in fact what Ablo did was Ablo got in touch with Hunter Hunter Biden's lawyer and said you need to pick this uh, this laptop up um, but this is what's happening and by the way according to the according to people who've seen the slides including CBS the slides that Kevin Morris is is advertising around the place includes one with a cartoon like drawing and contains the classic movie tease coming soon so this documentary is coming soon and we just say bring it on we're all about you know you can make all kinds of documentaries you want just don't misrepresent who you are and this is not a documentary a documentary is not made by a lawyer representing a client that that's not that's not how documentaries documentaries are made by disinterested journalists who are just telling the truth telling a story uncovering the truth no matter which what way the cards lie this is not what this man is up to. This is not what Kevin Morris is up to. Kevin Morris is doing, is doing. It's a propaganda piece. It's kind of like it's um, it's a you know uh, damage limitation, distraction. You know, let's bring in this therapist. Let's bring in anything we can to distract people away from the actual content of the of the laptop. Anyway, there'll be more on that coming soon. And our movie, do not forget our movie, directed by Robert Davi and starring Gina Carano and. John James and Lawrence Fox in the title role of Hunter Biden is coming soon itself and we'll have more news on that very soon you'll be getting you'll be getting a, a trailer very very soon um it's it's being worked on right now and we're very excited to share that with you i know everyone's been patient waiting for this but the timing is we are being very careful about the timing of the release of this film. Um, we think it's very important that people get educated, that people understand the truth. And it's interesting to look at what is happening with, um, with Hunter Biden's massive, massive team working to distract people from the truth of this story. Um, so our, our film couldn't be more timely, couldn't be more needed to tell the truth at this particular moment. So other things that are very important and that need to be watched at the moment, obviously we're all watching and waiting for the Supreme Court to decide on whether or not Roe v. Wade will be um, overturned. Um, and one of the things that the left are doing at the moment, which is extraordinary, is they're, they're trying to terrorise people with stuff that's not true at all. They're saying that this you know, is going to be the end of all abortion. The only thing that's going to happen is the states, individual states in the United States of America will decide how they want to proceed, whether they want abortion on demand or whether they don't want abortion on demand. Before Roe ever came into uh, law in the first place, there was already plenty of abortion going on in America. Um, there'll be plenty of abortion going on after, no matter what happens with this decision. So, you know, be very careful where you're getting your information from because one of the things, again, that the pro-abortion people are trying to do here is it's a misinformation campaign. 
But one of the things that I thought was interesting, and I, I kind of, I've been thinking about this over the last while, is there's been a few examples over the last few years, over the last decades, of moments where p- pro-abortion people, pro-abortion mainstream media outlets have accidentally told the abortion story. They didn't mean to, but they accidentally did. And I want to look at three or four examples of that that I think are really worth looking at. And the first one is, you'll see this on screen now, the Life magazine cover from April 1965. And this was, this is just an amazing, amazing picture that was taken by the Scandinavian photographer. And it's an 18-week Living 18-week-old feet is shown inside its amniotic sac. Um, and you can see the placenta at the right. This is, this is what an 18-week-old baby looks like. You know, what's really very powerful about this picture is that in America, all over America, in basically, basically all over America, it's legal to abort a baby at this age, at 18 weeks. Um, and there's no mistaking the humanity of that picture, the humanity of the baby in that picture. This is not what a clump of cells looks like. And I think what was interesting was that the, the photographer involved here, once he realized that the pro-life people were using this image to tell the truth about, about abortion, by the way, to tell the truth, this is what you're aborting, he actually became very, you know, didn't like that and didn't want his, didn't want the ph- photograph to be used by by the pro-life side. And I'm thinking like, wh- why, you know, they didn't do anything to the picture. They just showed the picture and said, this is what's being aborted. But interestingly enough, yeah, he didn't like that at all. And he became, so it was a, it's a very good example of somebody accidentally telling a very powerful story. And I think it's an amazing picture. I remember the first time I found out about that picture was um, Vice President Mike Pence when we were at the White House. He talked about this picture changing his whole life, that it changed his whole political future, that he decided, he basically said he brought his family together after he saw this and he said, you know, brought, it, brought his family together and said, you know, we're going to go to Washington to save the babies. And it was based on this, this photograph had such an effect on him. And I can see why. And per- particularly seen as this was, you know, now we've all seen plenty of pictures of babies in the womb. But this particular picture was very early on in that process. So kind of an amazing one. The second, um, the second piece of journalism that accidentally told the truth about abortion, and I think is super, super powerful, is from Harper's Magazine in 1995. Um, and an author who was actually writing, and again, very definitely uh, a pro, pro-choice, pro pro-abortion um, writer, v- Verlin Klinkenberg, and he's been a writer with Harper's New York, the New Yorker, you know, he's written for everyone, and he's a, a beautiful writer. So he was basically talking about, you know, he was examining the, the pro, pro-life movement and the pro-abortion people, and looking, and he was actually, you know, investigating pro-lifers and protesters outside of abortion clinics and he goes to an abortion clinic and he's outside the abortion clinic and he's talking to people who are there and people who are praying there and all of that it's a very very long piece by the way and it's worth reading the whole thing um if you get a chance and we'll put up the link to it actually because you can you can read the whole piece by him and you'll realize that the context of it is it's very very um pro uh pro-choice it's a very very pro-choice piece it's a very pro-abortion piece but the interesting part is that in the middle of this very long article, this guy was asked uh, by the abo- at the abortion clinic where he was where he was doing this, which I think was in Wisconsin. He's asked, you know, do you want to come in? Do you want to come in? And he, so, so then he's inside the abortion clinic. He's talking to the workers there. He's you know walking around the corridors. He's talking to people who are about to have an abortion. I mean, so the article should be read in in its entirety. But at one point. Uh, there's a woman who has had an abortion and the uh, the doctor says to the woman, do you want to see, you know, the product? Do you want to see what, what, what we found or what came out or whatever, what this looks like? And she said no. Um, and then they looked at the author, they looked at this writer and said, well, do you want to look? And he said, yeah, of course, because he was like the journalist, so why wouldn't he look? And this is what he said. Um, and again, we'll put up this in the show notes because I think it's worth sharing and for people to share with other people. And this was what he said he saw when he saw the products of a 10-week um, abortion, of the abortion of a 10-week um, baby. I felt a profound and unmistakable kinship with the foot and hand in the tray. A kinship so strong, it was like the rolling of the sea under my feet. I was surprised by my own sadness, by the sense of loss that I felt. 
I found it so much easier to be moved by the sight of the disembodied hand the size of a question mark, gleaming under fluorescent lights. In that tiny, naked hand, there was the imputation of innocence. I think that's so powerful. And that's a 10-week abortion. You know, sometimes I think the pro-abortion movement, you know, say that the anti-abortion people focus too much on these, you know, very rare, you know, very rare events of second and third trimester uh, abortions. First of all, they're not that rare at all, actually. They're, there's a very significant number. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, so they're not, they're not that insignificant, um, by the way. But I think it was important to actually have that one. And I think that, that quote is very, very powerful, particularly when it's coming from somebody who is, you know, an accidental, he's an accidental witness to the truth. And he's certainly somebody who doesn't want to be saying what he just said. So I think from him, it actually comes, it's actually even stronger. And another example I came across recently, which I thought was really powerful, a book called The Rules Do Not Apply. It's a 2017 book by a woman called Ariel Levy. And I really liked the book. I thought it was really good. I mean, it's, she's super liberal. She would be very, very leftist um, person herself. And, you know, she's in a, you know, in a same sex relationship and she's having a baby and all this kind of thing. And she's a writer and um, she goes on a trip to Mongolia. And in fact, if you want to find the whole essay rather than even read the whole book, she writes, she wrote an essay called Thanksgiving in Mongolia, which won a lot of prizes and deserved to win a lot of prizes. It's really, it's a really great essay um, again. And it's, it's everywhere. You can find it um, again. We'll put a link up to it on, on the show notes. But when she's in Mongolia, and people told her she shouldn't go because she was pregnant and all of that, she goes and she is 20 weeks pregnant and she has a miscarriage when she's there and she describes it. And I think it's extraordinary. And again, what she describes is what is perfectly, you know, the, the, the baby that she describes, I'll, I'll read the piece now, but the piece that she, what she is describing is what is legal, is it's legal to abort a child at this age, when this is the description, if you know what I mean. So uh, I just want to read this, and I thought it was, I, it, re- it really struck me. She delivers the baby, and he's, and he's right beside her, and she says, this can't be good. But it looked good. My baby was as pretty as a seashell. He was translucent and pink and very, very small, but he was flawless. His lovely lips were opening and closing, opening and closing, swallowing the new world. For a length of time I cannot delineate, I sat there awestruck, transfixed. Every finger, every toenail, the golden shadow of his eyebrows coming in, the elegance of his shoulders. All of it was miraculous, astonishing. I held him up to my face, his head and shoulders filling my hand, his legs dangling almost to my elbow. I tried to think of something maternal I could do to convey to him that I was, in fact, his mother and that I had the situation completely under control. I kissed his forehead and his skin and his skin felt like a silky frog's on my mouth. And she goes on and she goes on and uh, uh, the the child dies very quickly because uh, he's so premature and she's in Mongolia and she can't get a doctor and all of that. But... I just thought the description was so was so wonderful. I just thought um, it's worth it's worth sharing because, again, that description, you know, she describes it beautifully. Obviously, she wanted the baby. But the idea that just because you don't want the baby should make the baby less perfect and less human is illogical and it's morally incomprehensible. Um, And I just think those kind of quotes are incredible. The other thing that I think that I read recently that I thought I would bring to people. And again, I'll put this up and I think it's really good to share is The best comedy is comedy that is telling the truth, you know, is when you tell the truth, that's what makes people, that's why people laugh so much. They laugh at things that are true because they're like, that's so true. That's, that's what makes it really comical. And the very best comedians that are around today have actually dealt with the abortion issue and been very funny because they're telling the truth. And one of the best ones, recent examples that I've seen is from Chris Rock, who recently in a show he did in Atlantic City, pointed out the very obvious. He said, you know, there's no such thing as a safe abortion. He said, safe abortion, yeah, that's an abortion where only one person dies, I guess. I thought that was a really great, um, just, you know, 
He, he also declared, I'm going, to read the, I'm going to read this piece, actually. I got this from the newspaper. At a recent show in Atlantic City, the comedian Chris Rock shocked the audience by pointing out the obvious. There is no such thing as a safe abortion. Rock's message was poignant. Safe abortion is an abortion where only one person dies, I guess, observed the comedian. He also declare, declared that he was not pro-choice, but pro-better choice. The comedian was attempting to shed light on a truth which is often obscured by the abortion industry. Abortion is a procedure which is designed to end a human life. Therefore, by its nature, it cannot be safe. Um, and by the way, he joins, you know, there's other, Dave Chappelle also makes um, abortion jokes that are very, very truthful. And so did Louis C.K. as well. So, you know, it's um, sometimes, you know, th- th- those comedians, by the way, are being really, really honest. The show that Phelan and I watched in New York the J.J. Abrams show was very dishonest because it didn't deal with abortion at all. It dealt with everything except for abortion. Um, and I think there was something very dishonest about that. That's why we did our show in New York. The New York Times had to write about us, were forced into writing about us twice, you know. And our next story, by the way, which I think is extraordinary, is State Farm. So State Farm is, a, you know, this insurance company. They have loads and loads of ads on the TV. They're one of the biggest insurance companies in America. And we found out through Consumers First, which is a watchdog, a consumer watchdog, emails leaked to Consumer First from concerned State Farm employees show that the company has engaged in the woke indoctrination of kids of from five years of age. State Farm has partnered with the Gender Cool Project, which aims to have conversations with children about being transgender and non-binary. In this set of books, students as young as five years old read about how it is cool to be transgender and what it means to transition. The book also claims that most children have a strong sense of their gender identity as early as four years old. Young readers are asked, have you ever heard the word non-binary? Do you know what it means? Describing how a doctor declares a baby, a boy or a girl after birth, the book tells students gender isn't that simple. So State Farm is basically asking their agents to partner with them. They, they've, they've written to all of their agents, and it's particularly, we obviously, the, 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 the one that was interesting to them was obviously the one that went to all of the agents in Florida, where they're asking people to get this bundle of books, the State Farm, start, State Farm insurance agents, to get this bundle of books and to give it out to teachers and to give it out to, 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 to kids so that kids in, in kindergarten will get these books. It's just, it's beyond belief. State Farm's initiative hopes to have 550 State Farm agents and employees donate and distribute these books to schools, community centres and libraries nationwide. Transgender kids are real. They are creative, joyous and, hand, and, and a handful, just like any other kids. There are hundreds of thousands of kids who are transgender. Hundreds of thousands of kids, by the way, who are transgender in the US. And they belong to every community and come from all different backgrounds. You know, this is what they're saying. This is what, this is what, this is what they're now going to push this out. And here's the, here's the opening of that book. Have you ever heard the word transgender before? You see that first page. Then the next page. Do you know what that means? It's okay if you don't. Let me try to explain. You see, when I was born, the doctor said, it's a boy. But I always knew this wasn't true. One day I looked up, boy who feels like a girl. By the way, how many five-year-olds are looking up stuff on the internet? Uh, Or allowed to do that even. And found stories of people who were just like me. So one night I wrote a note to my parents telling them who I was and slipped it under their bedroom door. And then the next page. Now I feel comfortable buying the clothes I want. Five-year-old, by the way. Buying the clothes I want. Now I can hang out with my true friends and sit with them at lunch. Now I can grow out my hair. Now I can wear makeup. Now I can use she, her pronouns. You know, and the last part of this is extraordinary, you know. The last, I just thought it kind of funny. You know, the very last page of the book was, Hi, my name is Hunter and my pronouns are they, them. Kind of funny that the name is Hunter given the first story we did. But I don't think that that's... I, I, I think it's an extraordinarily disturbing story. And if you go on Twitter, look for this guy who's, who's exposed this story 
really, really good work, by the way, from the consumers, consumers First. And look for Will Hild. That's at Will Hild, at W-I-L-L-H-I-L-D. Look at, look at him. He's the executive director of Consumers First. And he's the guy who's brought this story on. And he's, he's done a big thread on, on Twitter. That cat now. I've got a cat jumped up on the table here. He's being okay at the moment. But uh, I just keep an eye on him there. Hope he doesn't toss the camera. That's the main thing. Okay, pussycat, come over here. Come over here. Okay, he's all right. Um, but you should go, go, on, go on Twitter and, f- and, and look at the work of... I'll show the cat to you, actually. Here's the cat. Look, at just so you know I'm telling the truth. You see him there? Look at him. Look at the cat. Now he's going to go away. That's scaredy cat, by the way. That's scaredy cat. Go away now. Um, I would definitely advise you to go on Twitter and give some love to Will Hild for doing this incredible story. And the other thing that's amazing about this, by the way, or that's interesting, when you look at the thread and look at the bottom of the thread, the number of people who are writing underneath it and saying... I've got, I got in touch with, with State Farm. I have cancelled my subscription. I'm not going to be taking any policies out with, with State Farm. Lots and lots of people are saying that. Um, and I thought it was important to bring, it, bring this news to you because this is what State Farm are doing. We saw what happened with Disney. We saw what happened with Netflix and all these companies that are going woke. It's not working out that well for them because it's almost like they, you know, they need to, yeah, they need to listen to their consumers before they listen to a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of woke activists who are making, forcing them to do this kind of stuff. And they should resist it. And they should say no. Um, we saw a little good effort from Netflix recently, however, where they pushed back a little bit and basically said to, to people working for them, look, if you don't like the content, you need to maybe get another job somewhere else. The last story I want to look at today, which I think is also worth having a look, and this is from the New York Times from this past weekend, the New York Times, you know, where this one liberal academic who has this, who was extremely popular and had an extremely popular and profitable theory has now just said, oopsie, oh, I was wrong. Sorry about that. And not really sorry about that, actually. She doesn't apologize at all. Uh, her name is Lucy Calkins. And for decades, she is the person, you probably don't know her name, but for decades, she's the person who has determined how millions and millions of children learn to read. Um, she's been um, an education professor and she has been, she's the preeminent leader of a thing called balanced literacy, a very loosely defined ter- teaching philosophy. Um, and her curriculum you basically is built on a vision of children as natural readers. So the theory, her whole theory, which has been going on for decades, was based on this idea that children are natural readers. Now, the truth is, this is abs- of course, this is complete nonsense. And anybody who has taught children will realize that they are very definitely not natural readers. And that reading needs to be taught in a very old-fashioned way in a very old-fashioned way with sounding out words. All that old-fashioned sounding out words thing is the way to teach children how to read. But however, this woman, this woman, this Lucy Culkins was so popular and she has made an absolute fortune. Her curriculum has been adopted by 67,000 elementary schools across the United States, have used this and have used it for decades but there has been a very recent, very recent pushback um, against Professor Calkins. And now she herself has had to say, well, oh, yeah, you know, I was wrong. The problem, however, is, is that the damage she has done is irreparable. Um, and bef- this is, by the way, the damage she has done was irreparable. And that's even before, even before COVID. Only one third of American fourth and eighth graders are reading at grade level. This is before the pandemic. Black, Hispanic, and low-income children have struggled most. One-third. So there's a massive problem with literacy in America. Very much thanks to this woman's mad, cap, woolly theory that children naturally, they're natural readers. She's wrong. She's not saying sorry. She's segueing and sort of changing her, her curriculum slightly. But she's still out there having a massive influence on people, on education. Um, It's incredible. And the truth is that actually far from being automatic, reading requires a total rewiring of the brain. And one of the biggest parts of it is for a child to be able to look at the lips of the person teaching them how to read and how to sound out words. And so on top of the disaster of having this woman be so, so, so influential for decades and decades and decades. We then had the problem for the last number of years where small children have, not, have been wearing masks themselves and have also had teachers wearing masks. And it is a complete disaster. 
that is still not being getting the getting the attention that it should be getting. But um, you know, that's 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 the crazy world we live in, and how incredibly influential these leftist thinkers are with woolly woolly theories that sound kind of you know so, sound sort of woolly and nice and plausible, but are complete nonsense. Um, and children are paying a very very high price for the wooliness of it. I've come to the end of this show on my lonesome, on my ownsome. Next week, I really hope we'll have Phelan. Um, he should be well over the COVID at that stage. And just so you know, he's, he's not doing too badly. He has a little bit of cough and sore throat and a bit exhausted. But other than that, he's doing fine. Um, and I'll be very happy to have him with me next week. So that's it for now. And don't forget to uh, leave a comment in the comments and... Uh, keep subscribing and keep um, keep in touch because we have lots and lots and lots of very big news coming up. Thanks so much. Bye. Hey.